I'm Leila Saad, and my life is driven by one burning question. How can I become a good ancestor? How can I create a legacy of healing and liberation for those who are here in this lifetime and those who will come after I'm gone? In my pursuit to answer this question, I'm interviewing changemakers and culture shapers who are also exploring that question for themselves in the way that they live and lead their life. It's my intention that these conversations will help you find your own answers to that question too. Welcome to Good Ancestor Podcast. Artist, author, activist, and transformational leader, Sonia Renee Taylor is a national and international award-winning writer and performer, best-selling author of two books, The Body is Not an Apology, The Power of Radical Self-Love, and Celebrate Your Body and Its Changes Too. She's also the founder and radical executive officer of The Body is Not an Apology, an international digital media and education company committed to radical self-love as the foundational tool of social justice, whose content reaches over one million people monthly. She has shared her work and activism across the United States, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, Scotland, Sweden, Germany, Canada, Brazil, and the Netherlands. Sonia has been seen, heard, and read on HBO, BET, MTV, TV1, NPR, PBS, CNN, Oxygen Network, The New York Times, New York Magazine, msnbc.com, today.com, Huffington Post, Vogue Australia, shape.com, Ms. Magazine, and many, many more. She has shared stages with such luminaries as the late Amiri Baraka, Angela Davis, Sonia Sanchez, and others. In 2016, Sonia was a guest of the Obama White House, where she spoke about The Body is Not an Apology's work at the intersection of LGBTQIA plus issues and disability justice. Sonia currently resides in New Zealand, where she is an inaugural fellow in the Edmund Hillary Fellowship for Global Impact Changemakers. Okay, welcome back everybody to Good Ancestor Podcast. My name is Leila Saad, I'm your host, and I am here with Sonia Renee Taylor, the author of this beautiful book, The Body Is mm. Not an Apology. Welcome to Good Ancestor Podcast, Sonia. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Leila. I'm super excited to be here. I'm super excited to have you. We're like fangirling a little bit over each other just before I, we I love it. I love, it. <laughs> I love mutual affection. It makes me happy. Yes. Um, so <laughs> you're in you're in New Zealand, and you I, um, you divide your time between New Zealand and the United States. I was actually <laughs> some, well. Are you more in New Zealand? <laughs> I'm I'm in New Zealand. You're yeah. in New Zealand. I mean, I, I fly back to the states for work a lot, but yeah. um, but nobody's flying anywhere a lot right now. So <laughs> no, they are not. And that yeah, what I was going to say is that I was supposed to be visiting New Zealand this year, and I hadn't oh. shared with you yet. So I was like, she's the only person I know that's in New Zealand because it wasn't oh it wasn't yet public knowledge. And then yeah. Corona happened, and the Corona event happened. for which I was flying over was canceled. So. Um. Ooh, what was the event? It was the um, uh, what is it called? The um, uh, word, uh, the Christchurch, the Auckland, oh, the Christchurch Word yes. Festival. Yes. I did that two years ago. It's an awesome festival. It was. I was very excited to be invited and to be covered. So I know. <laughs> oh, Corona spills all the fun. It, does. it is. We're going to talk about that. <laughs> In this yeah. conversation. Um, so let's let's get started with our very first uh, question. Um, who are some yeah. of the ancestors, living or transitioned, familial or societal, who have influenced you on your journey? Oh my goodness, so many, so many, so many. I've been in deep, deep communion with my ancestors in the last three months, and so mm. I feel like I have like all of them are here. So I'm going to name as many as I can think. Um, first and foremost, my mother Terry Lynn Johnson. And my grandmother, Catherine Ann Taylor, Arnita Taylor, Catherine Arnita Taylor. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, my maternal grandmother and grandfather, my great uh, grandmother, Josie B. Taylor, um, my Aunt Mildred, my Aunt Minnie, and just a 
flanked all around me by beautiful, brilliant um, Black women ancestors who have gotten me thus far. Mm. Um, and then, I, you know, I want to name and honor uh, ancestress Lorraine Hansberry, whose birthday is today. Yes. Um, and then Audrey Lord, uh, whose work continues to um, unveil me to myself. And yes. uh, and um, Mother Lucille Clifton, whose work continues to remind me to celebrate my survival. Yes. So. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. I love that you brought up Audrey Lord. I always love when Audrey Lord's brought up, but yeah. in particular, <laughs> when I was pulling out, making sure I had your book here, I also wanted to make sure that I had this book here next to me. Oh. Um, the, mm. the Cancer Journals by Audrey Lord, yes. because so much of your work reminds me of this book. And wow. And I have not read that book. So it's, <laughs> It's, it's so good. And it's, it's, um, you know, a woman really wrestling with some of the ideas that you're talking about in, in real time, you know, in real time as she is moving through, um, breast cancer and the removal of her having to have a mastectomy, the removal of her breast, and then really inquiring around what is it to be a woman and what is my body Mm. and, and other people's expectations that I should have that I should want to have a prosthetic breast or I should want their, mm-hmm. it should, to, to look normal like everyone else looks. And is that mm-hmm. what I want? all of those kind of questions. And so, mm-hmm. you know, I, I hear ringing in that my body is not an apology, you know, or just uh, yeah, my body is not yeah. an apology. So I wanted uh, to make sure I had both of them with me. Uh, now, what a deep honor. Yeah, you you I highly recommend it. You you would it's all you it's done. It's, <laughs> it's actually it's the same it's about the same thickness as your book. Oh wow. Yeah yeah. Okay. Yeah yeah. Wow. So they're like handy little companions. Yeah, little companions. <laughs> I get to be a companion with Audrey Lord. Yes. Like <laughs> whose best life is this? <laughs> so so the subtitle of your book. So the title is The Body's Not an Apology. The subtitle is The Power of Radical Self Love. I want yeah. to know, before we even begin this conversation into your work, what are actually some of the misconceptions about what your work um. is about? Oh, yay. I love that question because there are so many. Um, I, you know, I think the number one is that people assume it's about body positivity. Yeah. That that's like some umbrella that it gets lumped under, which I don't think is. It, the issue is not that there isn't. The issue is that we have just made body positivity this benign, flat, um, apolitical. Yeah whitewashed <laughs> word that's about whether or not you know middle-aged white women like their gene size and um and radical self-love is as far as i'm concerned first and foremost a political framework it's mm. a it's a social justice framework and so um i invite people when they think about this idea of radical self-love to to see their relationship with themselves as a personal relationship and as a deeply political relationship. Right. And so our transformation is a political necessity. Yeah. Um, Audre Lorde says self-care is not an act of self-indulgence, but an act of political warfare. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And so I, yeah, I think that there's a way in which people want to make it um, soft and you know, consumable and mass media friendly by, you know, by, by making it, collapsing it with self-acceptance or collapsing it with self-confidence or self-esteem or body positivity and these other words that um, sort of defang the work that I'm talking about. And I found that really fascinating when you described that my work isn't about self-esteem, it isn't about self-confidence and it isn't about self-acceptance, not because there's something wrong with those things Things. but because they're not they're fleeting first of all right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) right they come and go um right and there are people who you describe you know um the current occupant of the white house as Mm -hmm. somebody who is very self-confident he is extremely (laughs) self-confident um Is Most that the whole right? Is is that what we're <laughs> what we're trying to aim for, or is there something deeper right. that that can not only heal us as individuals, but also heal 
as societally, collectively, globally. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think that's really, really, really important because these words, self-love, right, can be, have been manufactured now mm -hmm. in this time uh, in a different way than their roots and mm -hmm. do feel very fluffy and do feel very, oh, just love yourself, you know, just, just yeah. love yourself. And even the <laughs> right, and even the word radical is often used a lot in marketing speak and mm -hmm. um, these softer spaces, to, and is di is divorced from its political roots as well. Right. Yeah. Right. So when you're ha so when you're being invited into spaces to have conversations about your work, and people are coming at it from the perspective of the misunderstanding of what it is, mm -hmm. what is some of the pushback that you sometimes get? Um, I mean, it's interesting. I, <laughs> I think about this yeah. more and more, and I, yeah. I, I was like, I think, I, you know, I think I, I think I intimidate people, so I don't get a lot of pushback. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, it is, what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah, <laughs> I do think that people leave far more uncomfortable than they expected to be made. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so yeah. they think I'm going to come and make them feel real good. And what I do is I come and say, where are we complicit in how other people aren't able to bring about radical self and the love in their lives because yeah. of our privilege, because of our um, unwillingness to look at our positionality and power in the world. What bodies have you forgotten and how has that harmed us? Yeah. You know, and, 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 and in what ways are you bought into this system in such a way that it is a detriment to you and a detriment to people of color, to right. disabled bodies, to fat bodies. Um, and so I think that people both see what I hope at the end of the day is that they see a way out of, out of this, you know, matrix of oppression, both mm -hmm. for themselves, but they can also see a way, see a way to get out of the way of others. Yeah, yeah. So you're alluding a little bit towards, you know, what your work is really about. So what is, we've, we've said, what isn't radical self-love, yeah. right? What yeah. is it? What, how do you define it? Yeah, so, you know, I use the word radical to um, to operationalize love, to, to make it specific and not this sort of fluffy thing. And so, you know, the, the definition of radical speaks to being inherent in a thing, something mm. that exists inherently in a thing. And I deeply believe that we arrived on this planet as love, our our original relationship to our own bodies and to the bodies of others was love. Mm. You've never seen a self-loathing toddler. You've never seen a toddler who's like, I just really hate my thighs. It's, right. it's not ever happened, right? Um, that we come here enamored with our beings and mm. with the beings of others. Mm. Um, and so that's our inherent state. That's how we arrived here. Um, that Radical speaks to the origin of a thing. And again, that also is like, it's the origin of our relationships to um, our mental, emotional, and physical bodies. Mm. Um, and there's a disconnection that happens between that, but it is our origin. It also speaks to needing, proposing drastic um, or extreme or thoroughgoing change. Mm. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm proposing absolutely a kind of love that is thoroughgoing and drastic yeah. and I believe that's what we need to counter the systems um, and structures that exist in the world today um, and that proposing drastic political economic and social change and I think mm. that that's one of the ones that people often miss is like I'm not talking about a love that's just like bubble baths and kisses and nice face masks <laughs> I'm talking about a love that changes systems yeah. um, and that that love is 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 active it's a verb it mm. does things um it is it is not inert um and then lastly the foundation it serves as the foundation of a thing and i deeply believe that we have tried building 
our world on lots of things. <laughs> we've built it on capitalism. We've built it on um, monarchies. We've built, we've built it on a lot of different things. And we see the results of that. We are right. living in the results of that. And I believe that a, a world built on love, on the foundation of love, hmm. is the one that's going to get us to justice and equity, ultimately. So. Yeah love I'm talking about but yes and that is not how we normally hear love defined yeah. um and, yeah. and I thank you for breaking that down because I think that encompasses both like I said the individual and the collective but I love that it's also that when we have when when that love is pouring out of us it moves us into action it can't not exactly it can't not it's yeah. an, it is it it's it is a vibrant living thing. Yes. It has to move. It is, it is literally an um, energy. I mean, I think about it. Parents know this, like, yeah. you don't just love your children. And like, that's just like, Oh, look, I love this baby. I've never picked right. up or fed or right. <laughs> wiped their <laughs> <laughs> The love is what actually makes you do the things you don't feel like doing when you don't that's feel right. like doing. Them. That's right. You know, like that's what the care of the action is. And so yeah. if, if, if people are loving you in a way that don't have no action in it, it ain't love. No, no. Mm. It, it may be self-acceptance, right? It may be those other <laughs> things that we've said. They may accept you, but yeah. there's love. Mm -hmm. um, but there's love. And then the other part of your work is that this um, foundation of love is through the body. Yeah, yeah yeah so talk to I us use about that yeah i use the body because well so i think it's really important and this feels really important based on where i am right now in my own life that i have always since the body is not an apology started seeing the body as a physical mental emotional and spiritual entity mm. so i'm never just talking about our physical bodies i mm. think uh, that's what uh, if we were talking about misconceptions that would be another one uh, is that i'm right. only talking about the corporal body which, which um, explains how it would be lumped into body positivity because that exactly. is just about that it's just about the body yeah. right and, and just about some very specific things about bodies too, yes right yeah and and for me um Whole, if we're going to be whole beings, right, if we're going to be whole beings, then we are not just our bodies. Right. Um, and that there's actually an opportunity to, um, to ex we are always experiencing our body through, through our emotions and through our spiritual self, if we allow ourselves to be. And right. so that relationship that fractured relationship isn't a fractured relationship with your body. That's a fractured relationship with our emotions and our spiritual relationship to our bodies. Right. So we've got to be talking about that too. Um, and so, but also I think the physical body is useful to talk about because it's the great equalizer. You gotta, you gotta be in one, <laughs> you know, to be a lot here. of people <laughs> do this ride, <laughs> to do this ride, you don't have to do it in this flesh. Uh -huh, right. Uh -huh. So I think there's a way in which um, it gives us an opportunity to reflect on a thing that everybody has to experience. There are people who are very disconnected from their emotions. There are people who are very disconnected from their spiritual selves, if they yeah. even believe in such a thing. But you can't, you could try to be disconnected from your body. Your body will usually revolt. Yes. <laughs> it will tell you, hey, you've been ignoring me. Right. Um, and so I use that particular framework because it's one that allows everybody to find a way into the conversation. Mm. I love that you say that. So it's, it's the framework to get into the conversation, but then it takes us layers and layers deeper. Um, so much deeper. But yeah. even, but even that first layer is deep, the physical body and how mm -hmm. we, how we, how the media and how these industries around us, these oppressive industries, have given us messages about our bodies and what we're supposed to believe about our bodies and how they're supposed to look, how they're supposed to function, right? How they're mm -hmm. supposed to age. Um, that that itself, there's so many layers within within yes. that. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. You know, I I tried. I really think there's like the shortcut that I think about when I think about that because there are so many layers, but the sort of catch all of it all is that. We live in a world that tells us that there's a hierarchy of bodies, yeah. right? That there is some body that is better than other bodies, mm -hmm. right? And that we that we see that and understand that through um, through the lens of 
uh, gender and sex and race and disability and mm -hmm. size and age and mental health status. And there are all of these things, right? With all these markers that determine whether or not your body is a better body. Yeah. And as soon as we actually just acknowledge that there's no such thing as a better body, like, I mean, it's a simple notion that is also incredibly difficult. It, it, <laughs> right. It, right. 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 But it really is a simple notion the, the try on. There is no way that my body is a bad body. Right. As long as I'm here in a body that's actually allowing me to still be doing this ride yeah. <laughs> called alive then it's all right. It's a good body. Right. Um, and that's such a difficult, I mean, that's the like fastest way to, I think to unplug from the whole matrix is like, mm. what am I thinking about my body right now that has me plugged into a hierarchy of bodies? Mm. I've never heard it described that way, the hierarchy of bodies. And, mm -hmm. that, and that is so powerful because like you said, we can't deny the body. We all have them. Right. They look yeah. different, but we all we all have one. And it is this mm -hmm. hierarchy. You know, in my work, I specifically look at whiteness and white supremacy mm -hmm. and how white bodies are viewed as different to black and brown bodies. But there mm -hmm. also are all these other intersections of identities and ways that we experience the world. And it really changes how we see ourselves because of what the world tells us we're supposed to see and also then how other people treat us and experience us and how we're experienced in the world yeah. disconnecting from the matrix is saying i reject the notion that there is a right way to be a body yes yeah exactly yeah exactly and there are ways that we do this you know like you know i mean black people do this to survive we reject the notion that the white body is the right way to be in a body, right? right like we right. do that on a regular basis. There are communities do that all the time. It's when we start looking at the smaller, more nuanced, more um, very individually targeted messages that we actually buy those, you know, those mm, are the so ones where we're like, well, give us some examples. Absolutely. So that's the one, you know, those are the ones that are like, you know, hairy legs is a wrong way to be in a body. <laughs> and then you're like, then you're buying there or whatever else it is and never interrogating the idea that that message, like why, who said, yeah. who says so and why. Right? right. And then once we start thinking about that, we're like, Oh, right. Because people make a lot of money off of right. these products that they've got convinced us that we should be buying. So, we so keep yeah, distilling it down, you know, you keep distilling it down till you're yeah. like, Oh yeah, that too. That's, Oh, that's also another way in which, I'm told that there is a there's a body that's better than mine. Yeah. And all of it is part of the system to keep us disconnected from ourselves. It's so interesting that you bring up body hair because I was having a conversation with Maya, my 10-year-old, who I should have also said you are the author of a, another book that I had bought that was <laughs> that was for her and I bought it I bought it a couple of years ago um, and it helped us to have conversations about periods because I was like I don't know how to have this conversation with her. And that was the way that we had that conversation. So thank you for that book because you really oh, you empowered me as a mother to have a conversation about her changing body and the things mm -hmm. that are coming in a way that didn't feel frightening or um, so like I'm going to say the wrong thing or, you know, it was, yeah. Thank you so much for that. that oh, absolutely. Book. Thank you. I'm always really, I love when mothers and daughters, um, share that book together yeah and, it's and so so good it's yeah. so good so we were having a conversation yesterday about um body hair because my so m myself and my husband were um east african and middle eastern but because mm -hmm. of colonization arab colonization over east africa some of us have more arab in our genes and some of us have more african in our genes and that mm -hmm. then shows up in how our bodies look so my husband's family has more arab in his genes which means they have more body hair and i don't yeah and my children have taken after him and so she was saying to me oh i don't like you know the hair on my arms like i'm gonna shave it when i'm older mm -hmm. And I was like, this is so weird. Where is she getting this from? <laughs> this is, this from? That this is wrong. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I was trying to have a conversation with her, but without saying, no, it's wrong to believe that. Or, you know, right. not, you know, and sort of shaming her for that choice or that thought, but really trying to mm -hmm. inquire into 
hmm, so why do you think that body hair is an, is an issue, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's, yeah. it really brought home to me how young those messages start. And so. they're coming from some, because it didn't come from me and it didn't come from mm-hmm. my husband. So it's coming from somewhere. And it's just yeah. the, the air that we're breathing all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. The messages are pervasive. And, Mm -hmm. you know, if you exist in a world with any kind of media, you know, all she needs to do is watch, you know, 40 hours of television over her life that never have women with body hair. Right. Right. Like that's, that's it. You know, all she needs to do is see all cartoons with, you know, where girls don't have hair except on their heads. That's right. And then it becomes abnormal, right? Yes. And so the messaging is so, you know, the messaging is also in the absence, right? Mm-hmm. That, that which we don't see must not be worthy of being seen. Mm. And so then then we make a story about that. Oh, that's well, that right. must be because that's wrong, right? Right, um, right, right, right. Yeah. Oh, wow. So we start all, all start getting these messages very, 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 very young. Very young. Yeah. So, so tell me about your journey and what, what are the messages that you got that you feel led you into the work that you're doing? Yeah. Um, I feel like, you know, uh, my work has been a hodgepodge of things. Um, Mm -hmm. my background before I started running the body is not an apology and started writing books. I was a performance poet for 10 years. So I traveled around the world doing poems. And and you're amazing. Uh, I have to say this, like I didn't realize you were a performance poet until I Googled and was checking out some stuff. And I was like, what? She's amazing. Like amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, poetry was was my career, and then before that, um, uh, I did a lot of nonprofit work around HIV prevention and sexuality and mental health, and so, and then, yeah, and and before that, I was a you know struggling young person, uh, putting myself through college and navigating um, addiction and disability in my family and all. And so I think that my life experiences Hmm. were, were kind of cobbling together this, this current iteration of my existence where it's like, what's the intersection of, you know, mental health and sexuality and disability and blackness and fatness and like oh uh, oh I guess that's the body is not an apology right. apology yeah uh, yeah so it it all felt very serendipitous yeah um, yeah it all felt very serendipitous what's the healing the inner healing work that you have had to do in order to build and sustain and share this body of work um because so much of it is because I often think about the work that I do with me in white supremacy and I know that I'm able to do the work that I do in the way that I do it because of the inner work that Mm -hmm. I do (laughs) because without the inner work I'm I'm moving from a space of woundedness anger grief and not that those emotions are wrong but they they're not sustainable for me to to do this work that is that for me is love work this is love work absolutely yeah absolutely yeah yeah I think so I mean so much of the body is not an apology has been um about building the plane as I'm flying it right yes (laughs) yeah so it's definitely it started because it was, it was a need for me. Mm. And I said this to a friend the other day that like, we're talking about um, writing and they were asking about what is, you know, like who do, when I'm sitting down to write, who am I writing for? Right. Mm. And, and, and my instinct was always like that the first place, first person I'm writing for is me. Mm. Um, But I'm writing for me with the understanding that I couldn't possibly be the only person out of 8 billion people who was having this experience. So, That's right. it, so, it's, so it's through my journey of my own healing that I actually have something mm. for anyone else. Mm. And that, that, that the only place that that question actually gives rise to is when we actually believe that there is an other, right? Because if there is no other, then writing for me is writing for you. That's right. It is, 
That's it is right. essential. And yeah. so, um, so when the body is not an apology came around, what I was, I was in a conversation with a friend who was afraid that she might be pregnant unexpectedly. And I had asked, I'm nosy. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I was asking her about her safer sex practices. And I asked her why she, um, why she didn't use a condom with this casual partner who I knew was a casual partner. My friend had cerebral palsy. And my friend said that her disability made it difficult for her to be sexual. So she didn't feel entitled to ask this person to use a condom. And I said to her, mm instinctually or not even instinctually supernaturally is what i believe today i said your body's not an apology it's not something you offer to someone to say sorry for my disability and when i said that it was immediate that i was like that's not just for her yeah like it was immediate that i was like where where to have you offered yourself as an apology sonia where are you still offering yourself as an apology and that gave way to a poem and and you know i believe that poems are spells so i do too I'm, yes <laughs> so as i'm on a stage saying this spell again and again and again every night yeah. um the spell is is asking me where yeah. where where are you where are you in alignment with this and where are you not yeah. and so um you know, one of the tiny ways I wasn't in alignment was that I had like a selfie in my phone where I felt fabulous. I was getting dressed for a, um, for a gig and I had on this little black corset and I was giving it to the people, as I like to say. <laughs> and, and I was listening to what we call the outside voice inside us, the voice that tells you that you you are not as beautiful as you think you are. You are not as good as you think you are. Do not share this mm -hmm. photo in your fat black body. It is not okay. Right. And, um, and so it kept me from, it kept me hiding this picture, even though I felt incredibly right. beautiful. And in say body. that again, the outside voice that's within. The outside that voice you? inside of us. Yes. The outside voice inside of us. Yes. So any of those voices that self-deprecating, you're not good enough, you're going to fail, mm -hmm. you know, I can't believe you look like this, you need to change this, that voice is not your voice. So if we go back to the idea that radical self-love is inherent. Right. right this is who we are in our foundation. Right then that couldn't be us talking to us because wow. that's not how, that's not how love would talk to us that's and right. so but but we can certainly identify in the world what would talk to us that way mm -hmm. right we can mm -hmm. we can hear we can see the commercial we can listen to you know our mother who was really cruel to herself and then cruel in the way that she talked about our bodies right we yeah. can we can hear where the inheritance of that voice came from mm -hmm. and then once we distinguish it as not our own we actually have some efficacy in whether or not we have to listen to it. Right. right? We're, at choice. We're at choice then. So that voice, that outside voice was telling me, don't you share that picture? Mm. And um, one night I defied the voice and I defied the voice because I saw like a plus size model who was in a curvy black corset looking fabulous, minding her business and making money in her big thighs. And, That's <laughs> and right. her, her choice to be unapologetic gave me permission. Yeah. Just her choice somewhere else in the world, minding her business. She didn't know me from Adam, Eve, or a can of paint. Right. But her choice to live unapologetically in her being gave me permission to do the same. And in that moment, I decided to post that picture. And then I invited other people to post pictures too, where they felt powerful and beautiful in their bodies. And that's how, that's how it got started. But all of that was because I was being called to move out of my own way of apology. And yeah. then I just, and along with it, I was like, I, I'm sure I can't be the only one. So let me invite some other people on this journey. Wow, that is that is so powerful. I, I love the kind of the idea of the spell casting you each time that you were saying this Every, poem, right? It was, you're putting it out and it's coming right back to you saying, not, okay, <laughs> <laughs> live it then, embody it yeah. then, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's powerful, but also that someone out in the world, because we never know how the ways in which we are, are um, courageously showing up as ourselves in our lives is giving other people permission for them to do the same thing. We really don't know. Yeah. Here's the thing that I think is wild right now. If ever there were a time to be heightenedly aware to the fact that life is contagious. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we are in that moment right now. Right. We are in that moment that who we are and how we move through the world 
impacts one another. Right. That we that that we are constantly spreading something. Yeah. And the question becomes, what is it what that is we it? desire right. to spread? And that yeah. ties so so beautifully into how I view when I talk about being a good ancestor, because I really talk about you're going to be an ancestor anyway, regardless. So, right? Okay. So regardless. So and the way that you lived your life, the the choices that you've made in the world, are going to also impact people regardless. So you can consciously choose to shape what that influence is going to be, or you can just leave it a chance and see what happens. Mm -hmm. But either way, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have an impact. <laughs> right? Right. Right. Exactly. So that, chance don't be always looking so great. You might exactly. Want to right. Personality about yourself. Exactly. Um, when you, so when you're saying about the outside voice that we, that we speak from within, you know, I'm thinking about one of the things that on my own personal journey, that was a huge, um, like a, one of my core wounds that I, that I've healed is around my relationship with my mother and mm. the mother wound and the black mother wound and all of, mm. all of that. Right. Um, but mm. I think where the real healing came for me was when I understood that it wasn't even just about her and I, it was about the way that I had seen her when I was a child showing up was actually influenced by these other things, was influenced by mm -hmm. the fact that she was an immigrant, the fact that she was a woman, the patriarchy, racism, you know, all of these mm -hmm. systems actually were in our relationship, mm -hmm. influencing mm -hmm. her, influencing me and influencing our relationship with each other. And it gave me permission to give her permission yeah to be who she was and yeah. for me to be who i am and so i had a sense of red, radical acceptance in that regards um but mm -hmm. i'm thinking about when you when you were saying about the outside voice right that it's not just about oh that's just because of how i grew up and my mother was a particular way or my father was a particular way or the teacher i had the all those things are influenced by these outside forces of systems, exactly. right? And you talk about body terrorism, mm, yeah. which, is a, which is a radical term right? <laughs> in itself. Yeah. Yeah. So talk yeah. to us a little bit about that, because I just know for me, having that wider understanding allowed me to relax a lot. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, because it stops being, you know, some either individual failing or some failing yes. on your part or some failing on your mother's yes. part or, you know, all these things where we're like, we're just individuals and we're to blame for whatever the outcome is, right? Yes. And when we think in the, the, when we bring in the lens of the larger systems that are at play that live in us, yeah. then we can start to see how we are being influenced, manipulated, um, you know, and, and, and sort of constantly under attack in the ways in which we're in relationship with our own beings and, and with the beings of others. Yeah. And so body terrorism is the way that we talk about the historical and present day systems of violence mm -hmm. and oppression that are enacted against bodies that we consider non-normative or bodies that are not the default body. Right. And when I talk about the default body, you know, like, when we're you, talking about dominant culture. We're talking about supremacy. Culture, talking, right, like, right. Exactly. Like, who is it in your particular society, realm, or culture yeah. that we assume, it, when we say people, that, that we that's assume who we're that referring body. to? Right. <laughs> that, you know, and like, is that body white? Is that body able bodied? Is that body thin? Is right. that body um, young? Is that, you know, like, yeah. all of that's the default body. Yeah. Um, and so the systems, of patriarchy, the systems of white supremacy, the systems of ableism, of homophobia and transphobia, those mm. systems are not just conceptual. Those systems mean to do damage to bodies that do not conform or do not acquiesce to the will of the dominant paradigm. Yeah. Like those, and that's so know, key. They mean to do damage. It's not. They mean. It's not a damage. default that accidentally harms. Right. It's no. The aim no. of it. It is <laughs> harm. The aim right. of it is control or harm. So yeah. either you are under my control mm -hmm. or you are expendable. And that is. Mm -hmm. I mean, we see that with police violence, right? right. It's like, 
the assumption that the black black body is a dangerous body and the assumption that the black body is a disposable body. Right. So of course the first thing we do is kill it. Mm. Not not inquire about the situation, mm. not give it the benefit of the doubt in the way that we give other bodies the benefit of the doubt. Right? right. And so there's right. there are um so that system in the the fruits of those systems of of oppression um, are what we call body terrorism. And we call it body terrorism because it is a terroristic society. Yeah. It's a terroristic society to be driving in your car and be afraid that a routine um, traffic stop will end in your death. Mm -hmm. It's a terroristic society to, um, to be cast out of your family and then onto the street where you will be met with epic sexual and physical violence and then murdered at a young age because you're a trans woman of color. Right. It is a system of violence to be consistently misdiagnosed by medical professionals because of your weight. It's a terroristic way to live in a body. Mm -hmm. And that that terror is not accidental, that it is for the purpose of political and economic gain. Yeah. And so we have used the word terrorism, you know, as a way to malign and harm um, Muslim and Arab bodies. That's right. And I feel like it's important to take back that term and direct it, direct the lighting onto the systems in our own societies yeah. that are actually enacting terrorism on our bodies every day. And, and that have for, ge for generations and generations. <laughs> Perpetually. Yeah. Perpetually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. Um, I'm really thinking about sort of as we are breaking down these, because I'm, I'm sort of seeing myself as this one individual and there's all these systems, right? And how do I, as the individual, like overcome all of these messages and this history and this, all of this stuff, like where do we begin? And also I think, I think a huge part of your work that is, is really important is that actually I'm not alone. It's not just me, the individual. It's yeah. not, it's not. And so we are, first of all, the notion of individualism is a lie. It's an illusion. Again, if ever we lived in a time that was here to shine a spotlight on the fact that there is no such thing as individualism, right. it is the time of the coronavirus. That's right. It's the time where it's like everything we do could have an impact on someone else's life. That's and right. their life can have an impact on ours, right? right. And so the, the great mythology of individualism is, is expired right yeah. now. Yeah. Um, and so what that means is that um, you're, we're not alone in, in trying to figure this out. Um, mm. And the thing that I feel like is even, this is the, the piece that I find fascinating about this work is that it is both about the collective, but that our individual existence is so necessary, so essential for the existence of the collective, that what it is we do for ourselves will transform the world. That's right. And that, that is what matters, right? And so we don't have to be like, how do I beat all of patriarchy? How right. do I beat all of the, Well, all it's the same, the, right. It's the same with, with me and my supremacy. And I tell right. people, that, start here how first. Do I, this is right. where we need to start. <laughs> Yeah. Here. Yeah. How about you just beat it in you? Yes. Yes. <laughs> if yes. you just start to beat it in you, yeah. then what again, because we talked about this idea that love is an activator. Yeah. Love is 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 kinetic. And so once you begin to do undo to look for and undo where those systems live in you, mm. more of what is inherent starts to come through your right. inherent sense of love, your inherent sense of connection. And then that puts you in action with other people toward a more just and compassionate world. That's how that happens. That's incredible. And, and the thing that I just got when you said that is the understanding that love is, is limitless. Limitless. It's limitless. So there's no, um, there's no, there's, there is no limit on once you are in that practice, right? Because it's not a destination. It's not a place that you reach, right? Nope. That you, okay, got it. I'm, I am radical self-love now, right? <laughs> I'm just got an image of a, of a care bear just beaming out, you know? <laughs> I love it. I love right? but it. So that the daily practice of it is this daily re 
filling and when yes. we fill we overflow and that <laughs> overflow is limitless that overflow is limit and i tell people all the time um you know i've been having this conversation a lot like i don't i tell people all the time i don't give i don't give from my cup unless it's overflowing right you can't have what's in my cup you That's can right. you can have the overflow exactly. and so i tend to myself in such a way i tend to my radical self love practice in such a way cuz i desire to be an overflow cuz i recognize that that's where connection happens that mm. that's where activation happens that that's where interrupting and joining my power with other people's power to interrupt systems happens yeah. but it requires that my cup be full that's right so and that you, that's my work how do you fill your cup um, you know, it's different it's, for everybody. I think that's everybody. important for people to know. Yeah. Um, I think that the first thing for me is absolutely. And I feel like this, I'm going to say that this one is true for everybody. You got, you got to tend to your wounds. Yeah. You got to tend, you got to, cause other, you got to tend to the holes in your cup. Cause that's yeah. what that is. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's what that is. Yeah. Right. And so you're I'm refilling not, and it's just leaking out of those holes. Out, right. It's just leaking out through my mama wound. It's leaking yeah. out through my, and I'm going to be abandoned wound. It's leaking. Then I'm never a full cup. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, therapy has been a transformative model for me. I'm a, I'm a deep believer in all the tools. Like the more yeah. tools I have in my tool belt, the better off I'm going to be. So I've done 12 step and personal developments and therapy mm -hmm. and all the things. <laughs> Um, but I have found that, you know, I just started, um, a somatic, uh, somatic healing practice. And mm. so really looking at like, where is trauma still living in my body? I have talked it all out, but you know, right. but these cells still say danger around right. certain things. And so how right. do we move that through? Um, I also have what I like to call a decadence practice. I am deeply moved by beauty and, um, and what feels succulent and rich and vibrant. And so I try to make sure that that exists in my world, whether that's yeah. brilliant, bright colors. Um, sometimes that's some extra, just ridiculous, delicious meals. Yeah. You know, it's like, I want lobster tails with sriracha drawn butter and garlic today. <laughs> <laughs> and so there are times when that's the practice, um, looking for places, um, to be reminded of my right sizedness in the world. Um, mm. So I spent a lot of time at the ocean. Mm. And lately, I've been spending a lot of time at the ocean at sunrise, mm. where I get to be reminded that I'm invited into a new day, that I'm invited into another chance yeah. at this living. Um, and that it keeps me, yeah, it keeps me right sized in the world, that I am both one in eight billion and i am one in eight billion and that both of those things are necessary True, and important. at the same time and important yes i love that you said it reminds me of my right sizeness because one of the things that i have um you know i love clothes right i love um you're always fabulous i, <laughs> I, love, I love i love dressing up um but one of the things that i first of all you know like many people especially women I've had a um, messages around dieting and what size you're supposed mm -hmm. to be. And if you surpass a certain weight, that means you're overweight. And so you're mm -hmm. constantly trying to get back to that weight in order to prove you're the right size. And a couple of years ago, I just released that. So I don't weigh myself, mm -hmm. I don't know my weight. I don't know. I I'm just, this is my body. This is the body you're going to get, yeah. right? So. Yeah. <laughs> and part of it's also that this is my, the way my body is, it, it looks like the way my mother's aunts, grandmothers, you know, maternal ancestors, like we're African. This is how our body yeah. looks. So for me looks. to say it's supposed to look like this is for me to say I'm not supposed to be African. Right. So, yeah. so that is like, that's a, a form of radical self-love for me. But where I was going with this is that I came to a realization when you're, when you're in the changing rooms in shops, and you try something on and it doesn't fit. And the conversation for me used to be, oh, my body is wrong. That's why it doesn't fit into these clothes. And now mm -hmm. the conversation is, these clothes are wrong because they don't, <laughs> because they don't fit. <laughs> you make the clothes for bodies, right? but it don't fit my body. It don't fit so. my body, right. So it's not, I have to shift to, to fit into you. you 
I'm right. wondering why you don't fit all bodies, right? Exactly. Um, exactly. And, and so when you said about you go to the ocean, it right, reminds you of your right sizeness. It's like the ocean isn't like, oh, I'm supposed to be smaller than I am, right? <laughs> you can't believe I just got all these gallons on me, right? right? <laughs> Exactly. Right. Exactly. And that, and, that, and, that, and that shift is, oh, it's just huge. And nature has so many places for that. You know, mm. like we're, we're never like, we can't believe that tree is so big. Right. <laughs> <Isn't that> big? <laughs> <Unnecessary>. <laughs> There's nothing else in the natural world that we shame for growing right. bigger except right. for human body. Right, right, right. And um, yeah, and, and you know, I kind of, I don't want to go down the route of, the ways in which there's the false sort of um, equivalency of a fat body is an unhealthy body because we just, there's just mm -hmm. enough, there's just enough evidence that you we, we, people can go research true. that, right? A thin body yeah. doesn't equal totally a healthy cool. body. A fat body doesn't equal an un unhealthy body. But I think we still, that's still somewhere in the back of the, of the mind and fat phobia mm -hmm. and, and the, and the reasons that we give for why this isn't the right size breaking out of that and just saying this is this is my body is radical it's it's huge absolutely absolutely yeah. absolutely and we're and raising to attention the ways in which what i think is important for folks to remember is that none of these systems are um separate that they're all yes. interconnected i invite people to read um fearing uh fearing the black body the racial origins of fat phobia by sabrina mm. strings um, which details the history of the relationship between white supremacy, yeah. um, uh, chattel slavery, and the Protestant church. Mm. And that the body norms that we adopt in modern westernized civilization are rooted in a white supremacist, uh, you know, a white supremacist Protestant um, bourgeoisie ethic that was yeah. about white supremacy and, and racism. Yeah. And so, you know, when I find myself in a conversation about somehow being in my wrong body, I'm like, oh, that's also just a way in which I'm, I am internalizing white supremacy. That's and right. I get to, you know, I get to dismantle that in myself in yeah. all of the ways in which it shows up. Yeah. You know, and, and what's interesting is wh what um, dominant culture and systems of oppression say is right is a right body shifts over time, right? So we're seeing now we're in a time, right? Now we're in a time where certain features that are usually found on black women, you know, are seen as attractive when they're on white women and non-black women, mm -hmm. right? And so it's like, oh, but I, you know, I remember um, growing up and it sort of being a young a young woman, right, an adolescent than young woman, and I didn't want to wear ever bright lipstick. Because lipstick. Exactly. I was told the same. Attention. Right. You draw attention to your lips. <laughs> Big lips are ugly. Thin lips mm -hmm. are where it's at, right? And now I'm yeah. like, hold on, I spent my whole life <laughs> not doing this. And now people are plumping their lips and is <laughs> their lips. And, exactly. And and so it shifts over time. And so it's like you can't we can't buy into the fact that they're telling what they're telling us is correct because they shift yeah. they shift it based on you know all kinds yeah. of things. Yeah. Wherever the wind blows, whatever the market is looking like today, That's whatever it. the you know the the most pop whoever's selling the most albums who has the most eyes who has right. the on them you know like that's right. going to push more products it's all you know capitalism is is interested in making money yeah. <laughs> like, and it is happy to make money off of our self-loathing it's it's yeah. great yeah, happy yeah, to yeah. Um, yes and so when i'm in a space of self-loathing i just continue to remind myself who profits who profits off of this self-hatred that i'm experiencing right yeah. now yeah, and then I'm like, yeah, no, you don't, you can't have my coins. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And, and the other thing is, you know, and I think you spoke a little bit about this um, earlier, but I really want to drive this point home, which is that when mm -hmm. we are in that relationship of radical self-love with our own bodies, we then will, that will extend out and we accept, not accept, we love all bodies. Yes. Yes. All bodies that are not just bodies that look like mine and that function like mine, but those that don't as well, because how yeah. can I not if I'm radically loving all of who I am? Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and it, 
what I start, I feel like that radical self-love gives us the opportunity to see, because as we dismantle the story about how our body is not enough, then we start to, then we recognize that the story has holes across the board. That's right. If it, was not, if it wasn't true about my body, then, then it can't really be true about anybody's body. So where, where are the rules that I'm still abiding to about other people's bodies? And yeah. if I truly want a liberated experience in my own body. So yeah, I think that part of what our own radical self-love work does is it, it helps us get acquainted with the boundaries of our own radical self-love walls. Because wherever the wall is, that means that there are people on the other side of that wall who are experiencing mm. oppression, right? And so, wow. oh, am I, am I lovable at this side? Because if I'm not lovable at this size, then there's a whole bunch of people on the other side of that size who I'm saying are not lovable. If I'm unlovable in this body with this particular disability, because if I'm not, then that means there's a whole host of people on the other side of that wall who I'm also saying are not lovable. And so that's how we get to expand our own individual experience into the collective. This is huge because I know that I will give I would, I would rather judge myself than judge another. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm so much more used to judging myself than I would to judge another, uh, that voice side, like, you know, I remember just talking about shopping. I remember, um, being in a changing room and I was trying on this, uh, jumpsuit and, um, and I was like, (laughs) the outside voice was like, you can't wear this. Look at it. Like, look at the way it clings and look at the way it does that. And then I remembered somebody mm-hmm. who I know who is in a fat body. And I'm like, I've never want, like she was wearing this and all I thought was she looked fabulous. She looked amazing. Like, I was like, I want that, what she's wearing. And mm-hmm. not in a kind of like, oh, she's my fat inspiration or anything like that. It was right. just, it wasn't the judgment of it doesn't look right on her because of the way it clings to her body. So yeah. if if I, um, if I'm saying there's a limit for me, there's a boundary, right? Then I'm saying that anybody who also looks like this or more it's than a boundary this, for them too. It's, exactly. It, that's me saying, well, none of you are acceptable either. None of you, you get can't to be, be here right? either. Right. Exactly. Like, right. again, if I'm in the hierarchy, if I am in the hierarchy of bodies, yeah. then I am affirming the hierarchy of bodies. Yeah. If I have decided that I am in the hierarchy of bodies, then I am affirming that that is true. And yeah. as soon as I affirm that's true, all the other systems that live within that, or that are, you know, situated against that hierarchy are validated. Wow. Yes. Yes. So it's not, um, there's, there's, Try, there's being in the hierarchy and trying to get to the top of the hierarchy. Right. <laughs> Let me be thinner, whiter, you know, exactly. more, more body, all of those things. And then there's, I'm walking away from this whole thing. Exactly. This, this doesn't work. Exactly. Exactly. This yeah. is all, this is all an illusion that reaffirms oppression. Right. And I want people who are listening to know, I mean, you have cultivated, I mean, you've got these, books right you've got the book the body's not the it's not an apology but you also have a website and a community yeah where people are having these conversations and so you know when we were saying about if you're feeling like i'm alone and i'm i want to break out of the hierarchy and i want to you know go down this other path like there's a whole community of people who are having these conversations um that sonia and her team have been cultivating yeah, I yeah. invite people to spend some time at the body. It's not an apology. Um, there is content that is, you know, eight years worth of content of people writing on the intersection of identity and bodies and social justice and healing and how we transform the way that we understand and live in our bodies and how we can transform the world through that. And so, yeah. you know, it's a great resource and opportunity, a place to go. And then, yeah all of the community is always having conversations on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Mm. Um, yeah. People are, you know, like join a book club around the book. There are yes. all kinds of ways to be in community. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. So we have to talk about something that happened recently. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. Uh, I do. <laughs> you are a, uh, one of the, one of the many reasons that I really resonate with you and just really like fangirl over you is like me, you love words 
and you're mm -hmm. able to channel words in a way that just really um, speak to the what people need to hear in this moment right and mm. and your words move i mean i think part of it comes from being a, a poet but it's like it's not something that you manufacture it's something that you just are um and so mm. you had this um meme that was of your words uh, a snippet of your words that you wrote about our corona times that we're in and i want to pull mm -hmm. it up on my phone um that these words went super super viral yeah. um the words were uh, we will not go back to normal normal never was our pre-corona existence was not normal other than we normalized greed inequity exhaustion depletion extraction disconnection confusion rage hoarding hate and lack we should not long to return my friends we are being given the opportunity to stitch a new garment one that fits all of humanity and nature Hmm. So you shared these words, these beautiful words, and they went viral. Um, yeah. And it went viral, and then something really weird happened, where suddenly <laughs> they were no longer attributed to you. Now, we know this happens on the internet, right? We know with meme culture, people will yeah. see memes, want to repost it, just cut off the original um poster's name right and then it becomes like this like urban legend of who wrote it we don't know right <laughs> but the yeah. but the weird thing that happened with your words is that they were now attributed to somebody else somebody who sits in a different kind of body um yes somebody who's work we're all familiar with in fact i have a couple of her books here we're talking about yeah. renee brown <laughs> suddenly yeah the words were going more viral and being attributed to Brene Brown. Yeah. And I actually, yeah. I actually thought they were Brene Brown's words because that's where, <laughs> that's where I saw them until yesterday. Was it yesterday? We we're on, I was on your okay. yeah. lab doing my research and I see these were actually my words and I see Brene Brown is posted about, these are not my words. These are Sonia Renee's words. <laughs> and I'm just like, how, how did this happen? Like, there's one. There's, there's, an, there's an image of her with the words overlaid on top, and I'm thinking it's one thing to remove the poster's name; it's an entirely different thing to attribute it to a different person and a person whose body is so different and so whose different, body yeah. fits closer to dominant culture than. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because <laughs> like, for me, I was just like, "Wow, <laughs> wow!" Whiteness. It was doing the most. Whiteness, my friends, my friends, I said, "Whiteness gone white." I was like, "Whiteness <laughs> is whiting today." <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, it was interesting. So when it first happened, um, I started getting mostly white people in my inbox tattling but it felt like this very tattling thing like it was like i just saw your quote and it had um Brene brown's name on it and i just thought you should know and i was like did you correct them like why are you <laughs> Am I supposed to now chase down the random person you saw on Facebook? Like now, the reason why I'm laughing. So in me and white supremacy, one of the things that we talk about is you and white silence. And mm -hmm. right, one of the things that um, people with white privilege often do is even when they see something and they're like, Oh, this doesn't look right. They, they won't speak it. They'll go and they won't speak. It. They'll go and ask us to speak it. Right. Mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. why I'm laughing. Yeah, totally. It's that yeah. totally. Like, yeah, it's like let. It's still an opportunity to let people of color do the heavy lifting, right? That's right. So it's like you saw an injustice, and your first instinct was to come and tell me to fix it. That's right. <laughs> um, and so I noticed, you know, and so those few people who, you know, where that was happening, I was like, if you see it, please correct it. But the thing that was also happening for me at the same time was it was this interesting challenge to my own ego um, in this way that was about, you know, like, does racial dynamics aside, right? And like, mm -hmm. there were so many things at play, right? There was like the Sonia that knows that 
um, you know, Zora Neale Hurston was buried in an unmarked grave that Alice Walker had to go back and find her and mark her grave, you know, right. like that we were fine with erasing her from history uh, right. and her gifts and talents. There is the me that knows um, that part of my assignment is to contribute to the collective pot of liberation that it is that we're all working toward, right? And so, and that I can't be like, but I brought the eggs, right? <laughs> <There's> a, <laughs> right, that, yeah. like that the recipe is supposed to be the recipe and I bring what it is that I bring to it. And then what we make is what we make and that it's not about my individual contribution. Mm-hmm. And then there's the part of me, the ego, who's like, but, Hold on but, a minute. Right. But I said that. But right. wait. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I had to spend some time parsing through that. And I think what, what I got to in the end was my job is to do my work. Mm-hmm. That's my job. And that I, I get to check, check in with myself and see if I trust my God enough to correct that which is incorrect in the world. That, mm-hmm. that, that that's actually not my part. Right. That's that my right. part is to do my work. Um, and that if I'm in integrity with my work, that I can, that I am going to lend myself to the trust that the rest of it will be made right. And, you know, and so that moment actually turned out to be a tremendous blessing. It's like somebody decided that Brene Brown must have said this. <laughs> I mean, they literally just pulled it her name. It can't have this been a black woman. Right. Right. This can't have been. Yeah, it right. Have been. This must have been. This sound like Brene Brown. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, but when Brene Brown corrected it, then it went viral again. So it right. sent it back out into the world. Right. And then all of a sudden, you know, then all of a sudden, Representative Rashida Tlaib in, is, you know, talking about it and, you know, oh. economist Robert Wright is talking about and Viola Davis is reposting. And then right. all of a sudden, the words have a, a new level of platform. Now, what I think is fascinating is there's still not very many memes with my face on it. People still didn't take my face and put my words right. on my face. Right, <laughs> like right, they right. right. With they did. That's right. <laughs> but, um, you know, but that which is for me is for me and can't mm. be taken. And so, and that my assignment is to do my work and trust my God. And when I live by that, then the rest of it will, will work out one way or another. No, oh, I yeah. love that. I love that because there's, there's a huge element of it. That's like, um, in what ways could this become a distraction from me doing exactly. my work? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it could have been, it could have been me chasing down yeah. thousands right. of things. <laughs> <Right. laughs> it could have been that, which would have been exhausting, you know, and was right. not what I was supposed to be doing. Right. At all. And at the same time, I do love that you talked about Sarah, Zora Neale Hurston and Alice Walker, because the erasure of um, Black women's yeah. um, contributions to the world, you know, yes. we, we see it, we've always seen it throughout yes time right yeah and we have to go we actually have to go looking for those voices so like just with the example as you said it's interesting that Brene's image was used in this meme but you have I haven't seen your image used at all on this meme yeah Um, we actually have to go and search it out if somebody didn't know what Sonia Renee Taylor looks like and they just see the meme with the name they don't necessarily they're not necessarily assuming it's a black woman Um, exactly and so I think I just think that part is is really important um, for the not for you, but for the person who was and people who had decided I'm going to do this instead. Exactly. This is what I'm going to do with these words, right? Is that, exactly. <laughs> is that you're and here's the thing: this erasure. Exactly, and here's the thing: I think is important. It's not my assignment and my work to go chase down everybody who misattributes my meme. But it is my assignment to chase down everybody who misattributes yours. Right. It is my assignment, you know, so what that which we do for each other makes sure that it doesn't happen. That's and it right. does it is the assignment of all the white people who knew that that was my quote right. and saw Brene Brown's face on it. It was definitely their assignment to go yeah. and correct that. Yeah. And so we can correct the record for each other, which yeah. then leaves the other to do their work. Wow. We remove the burden of them having to chase down because we did it for each other. That's powerful, Sonia. That is so powerful. Because <laughs> we just get to then just focus on what we're here to do. Yeah, um, exactly. The, the last thing that I want to talk about, because I think it's been, it's, it's a huge part of your 
journey is your relationship in your spirituality and your relationship with God. Yeah, um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that and how that sort of deepened your, your relationship with yourself and how do you show up in your work? Oh yeah, it has been, you know, I've, I've been talking lately to folks about the fact that I'm in a, a pretty spectacularly intense, what I've been calling a spiritual initiation. Um, I, <laughs> I, um, I've always been, you know, I've always had a relationship to God, source, universe, whatever way it is that we talk about that, which, which made things possible yes. <laughs> that which created the earth and sets the sun to rise that you know that i don't that that can't be an accident because it's so divinely orchestrated whatever That's that right. divine orchestration is um i've always had a relationship with that and i used to have a very sort of christian pentecostal relationship with mm-hmm. that but always sort of you know i've been i've been I've been pressing the boundaries of things for a long time. So <laughs> even in that space, I was a little like, huh, what are you doing? <laughs> huh? um, but, and then there was a long time where I still felt that connection to what I understand as God, but I, but I was like, we've dressed it in things that are horrible. Like mm. we have, we have, we've created structures around this that are the antithesis of what I believe God is because I believe God is love and so Mm. some of this stuff we're talking about can't be in alignment so then that sort of sent me to a whole other and for a while it just left me like mad you know Mm. um and then and then I found um I found a, a really amazing church when I moved to California um that is radically inclusive led by a black lesbian with you know, all the, the whole Deacon team was trans black wow. women <laughs> wow. and it was affirming vibe. I knew that it was my right church home when I went for the first time and they said, we welcome, they were in the welcome and they said, we welcome everyone um, whose teachings harmonize with the teachings of Christ. And I was like, come, come on for the yeah. choir. Of, <laughs> for, the, for the choir of love. Yes. Right. Yeah. That this, that it is, you know, like that it is about the, you know, that there's a space for all of it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and so that was sort of what led me back into the sort of a spiritual, a spiritual relationship. Mm. Um, but you know, I tell you what, nothing will get your spiritual self together than crisis and calamity. And so, yes. um, yes. And so as we were heading into this, um, global pandemic, um, my life kind of imploded. Mm-hmm. I was in a relationship living with my partner and my dog and we're getting ready to launch these healing retreats in my home. and um, Three days before the global lockdown where they closed everything and everybody had to stay home and all the businesses were shut, my dog, who I'd had for 12 years, who was like fur, my furry life companion, um, got diagnosed with liver cancer. Mm. And then uh, a day and a half after that, my, uh, my relationship ended with my partner extremely abruptly. Mm. And then uh, a, week a-, a week and a half after that, my dog died. And oh. so suddenly I was in this giant home that was meant to host retreats um, alone with no dog and no partner and all the things that I thought were how I understood who I am yeah. were gone. Yeah. Um, And it was this moment of deep reckoning with all the wounds, all the holes in the cup that I had been sort of patching over, but I didn't repair (laughs) all of those things. And also the, if everything else is gone, if everything else is gone, who do you rely on then? And what have you, what have you elevated above your relationship with your ancestors and your relationship with God? Um, And what happens when those things aren't there anymore? And all of a sudden, I started being reacquainted with what 
what really was allowed to lead my life, you know, with, mm. with all the graces that I had been given over the years that I was attributing to my own awesomeness, <laughs> you know, to all the places where, where my ego had decided that that's why this thing had to be away. And, um, and all of a sudden it was just me and my God and my ancestors for two months in a big old house alone. And they were, leading me and guiding me and giving me really specific instructions get up and go to the ocean so that you know you're right sized oh. in the middle of the night it's four o'clock in the morning wow. get up and go to the ocean. <laughs> um but also reminding me that that i am deeply deeply profoundly cared for and that if we are listening for how we understand love then what we're really listening for is that experience of God talking through us because yeah. that that voice of love of how we connect is is the divine in us That's and if right. we can learn to listen to that um then then we can learn to build from that That's wow what a what an initiation um <laughs> and um, what i know from my own experience is that often there there is no other way that it has to be that way because because rock because rock bottom is one of the greatest teachers <laughs> because there yeah. is no there is no um fooling rock bottom there is no you, you can't put on a mask you can't pretend it's not happening you can't your old tricks don't work you can't manipulate yeah. your way out of it you can't uh-huh. you know um there's a saying that my mom uh says it, it's in in swahili um uh, and Swahili, it says, Wakati Ukuta. And she says, do you know what that means? And I said, no, when she first said it to me. She mm-hmm. says, when you hit a wall, the wall will hit you back. Like, you can't mm. hurt the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. So yes. you can try, and you can rage, and you can say, this mm-hmm. isn't fair, and, this, and you can do all of that. But Ooh. eventually, you're just going to have to sit on your butt. And surrender. And like, surrender. This has been surrender. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's been, yeah, it's been the, it's been, yeah, probably the most transformative time of my life. And I've had some pretty transformative times, but this has been, this has been it. And it's, you know, and I'm, and I'm clearer every day Mm. why, right? I'm clearer why now and why this and, and yeah. And I think I I can't, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say that, like, I'm, I'm being told, right, like that I can't actually give the fullness of what it is that is my assignment with all those other things still in there, all those other illusions. I was about to say that. I I was about to say, I think it's very clear to me why that is happening Mm -hmm. to you, why it's happening for so many of us, because collectively, globally, like you said, we are, we are experiencing this globally. We're experiencing it differently depending on you know, our positionality and and all of those things, but we, but nobody is outside of this. We are all in it. Um, and, um, you know, in that, in that meme, in those words that you were saying, we're not going back to normal and we're also being called forth to, um, decide what intentionally we are going to be co-creating as we move forward. And, and that I think requires so that what you were saying about it's not about the individual ego we're all working together collectively but we're all working from our unique gifts and our unique experiences and our unique things mm-hmm. that we're here to do in the world and i think when we have those rock bottom moments this is what i've seen in my life like i hate going through them but i know when i'm going through them they're happening for a reason like i'm like i don't i really don't want to be here in this moment <laughs> But I also really trust that you wouldn't put me here, here if not right. for a purpose. Like the purpose is not yes. self-torture. The right. They're <laughs> not just being mean to me. Right. <laughs> That's like, right. You also mean to me. Right. Exactly. So this is going to soften me, break me open, um, have me confront wounds that, like you said, you were patching over but not really healing. Yeah. Um, and that yeah. doing that means I'm going to show up differently for myself and I'm going to show up differently in the world for other people. And, you know, um, as you were talking earlier, I was thinking, wow, radical self love is actually one of the greatest 
gifts of service to the world. Mm. Because the more we're in it, the more we extend outwards. And so it doesn't ever, yeah. it doesn't ever, um, like we were saying about it being limitless, but it's also like, it's never not going to be of service to other people. The more exactly. I'm like, I really am engaged in a practice and relationship of self love with myself, the more everyone benefits. It is an inexhaustible light. It's an inexhaustible yes. light. Yeah. So I see yeah. you on your, <laughs> where you thank are. You. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes. And thank you for sharing it because I know we often don't want to share that part, right? The messy part, yeah. the part that's like, I'm mm -hmm. figuring it out. And I know one of the things that you talk about is like one of the pieces that we have to make is the piece of, I don't know. I don't know mm -hmm. what's happening right now in my life. I don't understand. Yeah. Um, and we don't always have to understand. We don't have to have it figured yeah. out. Yeah. And yeah. that, and that for me, for, you know, for me is such a fantastic control freak. The, the power is in the fact that I don't have it figured out. Like actually yeah. whatever it is that is supposed to come into being, it is, it is only going to be able to come into being because I have finally given up the idea that I have to have it figured out. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. And that just goes back to kind of like, it's circling back to these systems and the control and the, the ways in which we try and, you know, categorize people and put boxes around people. And, 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 and that is happening in the systems, but it's happening within ourselves. Cause so many people I know myself included have issues around control and perfectionism and wanting to know mm -hmm. everything and, and feeling like I can only be at peace when I have it all figured out. Yeah. And which I'm, means that I can never be at peace. <laughs> Thank you. Right? <laughs> so the power, when you say the power is mm -hmm. in knowing that I don't have it figured out, that's a different kind of power as well that we're not used to. Yeah. And it's it reminds me of the like when you said like when I when I got that like, oh, there's a whole bunch of things in the mix between me and my mother. Oh, I don't have to hold all of that by myself. That's like, that's oh, right. I can relax them. Yeah. Right. When we don't have to know it all, have it all figured out, there is a a, a relaxation and invitation to ease. Yeah. Um, in that place. Yeah. One of the things, one of the messages I got this morning actually when I was getting ready for this, because you know, like many people, you know, as we're moving through this time right now, there's so much uncertainty and it's mm -hmm. external uncertainty but then it's also having us individually question like who am i actually and what does this mean for me and the things that i thought were stable are not so am i stable within and what where was i placing my power right questions of that mm -hmm. sort and one of the things that sort of downloaded for me today was the energy of um i don't know if you if you use the tarot or if you're familiar with tarot cards. I do. Yeah. Okay. So the energy of the fool, the card, the first card. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought that is, that's the energy of right now. Like that is yeah. where I, that, where I need to be right now is the energy mm -hmm. of the fool who is on this journey, who doesn't know <laughs> and it's fine know. with the not knowing. Joyfully, joyfully not knowing. <laughs> with great joy and abandon. Yes. Leaping into the other. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, Sonia, yeah. thank you so much for this um, incredible conversation. I, I'm i taking so much from this, actually. And I can feel, um, I'm going to go back and like reread this book because it's been a while since I read it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, I think, because I got it, like I said, a couple of years ago when I got um, Maya, her book. And so I was in a different time of my life then. Yeah. We're, I'm in a different time now and we are in a different time collectively. And we are in a different time now. Yeah. So yeah. Messages, yeah. I definitely I, think for, yeah. for a lot of folks who got the book, it's like, it's definitely uh, pick it up in a different point in your life and you're going to get a different thing. Different thing. Yeah. yeah. So I'm looking forward to re to revisiting it. Um, so I want to close with our, with our final question. Um, <laughs> what does it mean to you to be a good ancestor? Mm. It means being a good ancestor means um, doing rightly and justly by myself, mm. by my family, by my community and by my world in this plane 
so that I get to be an extinguishable light in the next time. Mm. Yeah. I love that. Beautiful. Thank yeah. you so much, Sonia. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a true delight. True hey, delight. I'm amazing. a fan. <laughs> <laughs> we end with the fangirling. <laughs> yeah, <we care. laughs> this is Leila Saad, and you've been listening to Good Ancestor Podcast. I hope this episode has helped you find deeper answers on what being a good ancestor means to you. We'd love to have you join the Good Ancestor Podcast family over on Patreon, where subscribers get early access to new episodes, patron-only content and discussions, and special bonuses. Join us now at patreon.com forward slash good ancestor podcast. Thank you for listening, and thank you for being a good ancestor.